This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. Today we have John Cameron, a noted novelist, as well as James Just, who is the candidate, the Libertarian candidate for Assembly District 7, running against uh, longtime incumbent uh, Kevin McCarty. Uh, you're in a, in a minority majority neighborhood, uh, well over 50% of the population is either Hispanic or black. Uh, you're also in a very democratic neighborhood. There's not even a Republican on the ballot, uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, how do you plan on winning as a libertarian in that district, James? Well, we're coming at them from the left, Richard. Um, we're, that's what we're doing. We have 48.5% registered Democrats in this district with 20% Republicans. And let's be honest, those Republicans aren't going to vote for McCarty. So I, all I have to do is not scare them off. So so for the rest of the way, we're going to attack. attack. We are going to position ourselves essentially to the left. I'm asking unions to help with this police brutality issue. I'm asking unions to start taking a more proactive role in protecting themselves. I'm descri describing how the important role unions have played in history about these kinds of social issues of social change. And they have an opportunity to do that again and protect the reputation of themselves and their members. I think that's important uh, as someone whose family is a big union family, you know, the reputation of unions and their member are important to me and is a, in my, and my district is a heavily union district. And so I have to talk to union people. And so, you know, using the power of the unions to solve this immediate social problem we are facing today is actually a, a relatively quick way to try and get something done. The, uh, the, well, we can talk a little bit about the, the uh, riots or, or the, the uh, uh, disturbances that have been going on, not only in Sacramento, but of course across the country originating uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Minneapolis with the, the recent the police. Now they're calling it a murder of uh, an unarmed black man. And uh, you're right on the periphery of those uh, disturbances, riots, whatever you want to call them, as well as, I think it, it's in your district, right? Yeah, it's, all, it, it's in, I live in North Oak Park. I'm about three blocks from the UC Davis Med Center and about four blocks from the corner of Stockton Boulevard and uh, Broadway. Most of the action generally happens a little bit away from me, but we are in the area. And um, we get to hear the police helicopter circle, you know, at night. Um, we do hear some of the flashbangs go off sometimes around the neighborhood. So, you know, who knows if there's groups of people gathering in areas in our neighborhood. They're close enough for us to hear anyway. Um, most of the action does seem to be taking place downtown. I was mm -hmm. watching live streams last night. I was up till three or four in the morning watching live streams last night. And these protesters are being run ragged by both um, instigators. There's there's essentially three groups on the, on the street at 3 a.m. in the morning. There's protesters. There's the police. And there's a group of instigators who run around smashing windows, breaking cars. And the protesters are kind of running between both, trying to stop them. And they just can't. The protesters are not nearly organized enough. And these agitators are clearly organized. They clearly they come in, they are smash they, windows, they, grab stuff, agitators? and then run. Are they agitators from the left, from the right, or both? There's no way to... They don't hang around long enough to find out. They literally, okay. they come in, smash stuff, knock, go into the store, knock a few stuff over. And was, as the looter, as the protesters come over to, to trace, chase them away, they run off three blocks, let go around three blocks and start doing it again. And there's like three so, or four groups of them running around. So is this, do you think, do you think they're instigators or do you think they're people who are just using the protests as a way to kind of hide their looting? They're clearly organized. I mean, there may be a group of couple, a group of teenagers running around just smashing things because they hate their parents and are taking it down on society. I mean, I suppose there's always that, that case. But there are groups that are clearly organized going out just to cause chaos. Why that chaos? Why the, I'm not going to guess. I don't want to join in the speculation because you know who knows. But there's clearly a group, organized group out there causing chaos. Tell me, tell me what your approach to the unions is, particularly the police union. Well, wrote, I've, I have a letter, right? Yeah, I, I'm. I wrote a letter. I sent one to the California Police Officers Association um, this weekend. It should get there today. We're sending out more this afternoon. Um, we're essentially we're asking the police unions to police themselves. The un police unions are in a unique position to actually monitor and police themselves. They can have higher standards than the cities do for their membership. They don't have to put up with with police officers who have multiple multiple complaints against them. 
they they can actually instigate in investigations and get these people out of there or get them the psychological help they need. I, that's one of the things I also made in my letter that I understand. I can't even imagine what it's like to come up to a, a drunk driving incident and there's a dead family and you have to go home to your kids after that. And you see that every day. I can't even wrap my head around that. So they clearly, right? We, we're clearly not taking care of them psychologically as well either. These clearly emotional support that we're not giving these officers. So we failed them as well. And their unions have failed them. And so it's time for all of us to step up and protect both our police officers and the public at the same time. There's ways to do this and we're not. James, and I, I think it would be uh, it'd be very uh, uh, interesting for you just to read that letter. It's short. Read the, read the letter for us if you have it handy. Oh, sure. I can pull it up here. Let me. Just give me. A... All right. To our United States Law Enforcement Association. Once again, police misconduct is at the forefront of the national conversation. Law enforcement unions can play a vital role in bridging the growing divide between law enforcement and the populace. Unions have played a unique role in the history of the United States in worker protection, workplace equality, professionalism, and in guarding the reputation and integrity of their members. However, it appears to the public that unions are more interested in protecting individual members and their membership totals rather than safeguarding the integrity and the reputations of the total membership. This is leading to a dangerous situation where not only citizens' lives are at risk, but increasingly the officers' lives as well. Good, hardworking police officers should not have to put up with public backlash because of the misconduct and criminal behavior of a handful of officers. I understand that being a police officer can result in experiencing traumatic situations. Over time, these traumas can create PTSD, and we are not proactive enough in protecting our officers' mental health. This failure impacts not only our officers, but their families and the communities at large. I look forward to working with you to finding solutions. Police unions can play a vital and proactive role in identifying, disciplining, and terminating the employment of those unfit for duty. I urge you not, not to wait for government regulations or further public unrest. I urge you to institute tougher standards on your own. Citizens and members of police forces across the state and country deserve better, and our unions are in a position to play a vital role in affecting change. It is time for unions to exercise their obligation to protect the interests of good, honest, hardworking police officers and to find a way to root out violent and incompetent police officers. Question. Let's make America oh, proud oh. of our unions again. Thank you for your time. I didn't mean to interrupt. I thought I thought you were done. And I read the letter a couple of times, too. I should have known you weren't. So, um, <laughs> Question. Uh, yes, sir. Well, first of all, statement. I think that's a a, a unique uh, value proposition to the unions that they they might not have heard before, and so I think you you might uh, I think you will get some some headway there. Um, do you know if if um, any psychological profiles are done on this? Do, do either one of you know if any psychological profiles are done on uh, police officers uh, prior to, I know they do background checks and, and I think they have to have a certain credit rating and they can't have, you know, felony conviction and they can't have this and they can't have that. But what about any kind of uh, um, psychological testing or interview with a, with a therapist or something like that prior to hiring? Does anybody know? I believe that? most of them have, most um, of the police academies have some type of a psychological profile to get in. I'm not entirely sure what the extent that is, but we do know that they don't do enough after they've been a police officer. I mean, yeah, it's a fail. Right. It's it's a massive failure of, of society. We don't, as a society, we don't deal with emotional and mental health very well. No, and, not at all. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the statistics speak for themselves. We have way too many laws that we're asking a police officers to officers to enforce. That's at the root of the problem: drug laws, uh, prostitution laws, all of the victims crime laws. But the fact is, uh, police killed 1,099 people last year, 2019, and this falls disproportionately against minorities. 24% of those killed were black, despite blacks being only 13% of the population. That's, uh, that's totally unexcusable. Uh, black people are most likely to be killed by, uh, by the police, and they're, most, they're more than likely to be unarmed. So there's an awful lot of unarmed black people being killed. And uh, the guy in Minneapolis was just the last of, of many, you know, mm -hmm. starting with Rodney King in Los Angeles uh, years ago and going through to another guy in Minneapolis that was killed when uh, he was pulled over by, by police for a, for a, a, a taillight violation, told the police officer 
that he had a, a, a legal concealed carry uh, permit and uh, was shot uh, as after he told that by and witnessed by his uh, his young uh, child and, and his girlfriend who were in the car. I don't believe anything ever happened to that particular officer. The officer in the most recent case in Minneapolis is being charged with uh, murder, a third, uh, third degree manslaughter, but not, nonetheless being charged. But I think that's kind of a first, very seldom do police officers uh, acting supposedly in the line of duty ever get charged. They always uh, manage to uh, skate uh, based on the uh, sovereign immunity. I was, that's I a wanted, problem. I wanted to that's only a that. problem that can be solved. That, that's only a problem that can be solved if the police uh, police themselves and your uh, letter to the police unions asking for that to take place, I think is an extremely good first start. Well, I think the timing is wonderful because even, I, uh, even USA Today, which is not known as a, a mouthpiece for uh, the Constitution, has uh, uh, said that uh, it's time for, for uh, policemen and, and extrapolate other government officials to be held to the same standards that ordinary citizens are. And uh, the law in this area is really weird, unless, unless there's a specific example of a certain behavior being uh, declared not to qualify for sovereign immunity, then uh, the policeman can do it, and unless there's a very, very specific rule of law handed down by a judge, and other judges will look at the law and say, well, you know, this particular uh, action that he's taken has, has never um, never been defined as one that that uh, is outside uh, the, the range of uh, qualified immunity or sovereign immunity. So I think your, your letter and your unique approach with this kind of groundswell in the courts, uh, in, in the press of getting rid of the, the qualified immunity which has basically meant that that even if you do a crime as a police officer, uh, you're you're not going to be uh, criminally liable. I think that's great. So, I think Justin Amash has is working on the uh, qualified immunity. I believe he's introducing a bill this week to deal with the qualified immunity. But I, as a citizens, we sat there and watched real time what happens, how police officers get away with it. We saw how they framed the incident, how the incident was framed in, in the report. It has nothing like what happened on the video. There was a complete disconnect about that, how, what the police said happened and what the video said happened, right? There was a complete disconnect, how they wrote it. They, they waited days before the, the arrest of the guy, then they undercharged him. And then the initial coroner's report was like blamed hypertension and all kinds of other underlying issues. I mean, finally, the final report out today said he died of asphyxiation. So it was actually murder, and so the the, the, so the, the, the final the, report just today says it was murder. But the initial one said he died from other causes. It was underlying health issues, and so we're sitting here watching how we can how this how officers who do get charged end up getting away with it with nothing because with without being convicted, like that officer in Phoenix who killed that begging man in the in the hallway. He got off of that charge, and he's now collecting a thirty one thousand dollar a year pension. And we all we sat there and watched yeah, the, I mean, the, exa the examples are, are too numerous to mention. Yeah, <laughs> um, and there and there are you know are uh, policies that police unions could advocate uh, solutions uh, require uh, all officers to use all other forces before uh, all other uh, means before shooting. That reduces uh, police uh, induced fatalities by twenty five percent. You would require all uses of force be reported. They're not doing that. If they do, 25% reduction in police uh, murders. You can ban chokeholds. That kind of talks to the issue right here. Just ban chokeholds and strangleholds. You do that, 22% reduction in, in police-induced uh, fatalities. There's a whole lot of things that can be done that uh, unions could uh, lobby for uh, and that obviously uh, responsible politicians could enact uh, that would you know, eliminate a whole lot of the problem. But I think, you know, those are those are procedural things. Mm -hmm. The main thing that has to happen in our society as a whole is we have to get rid of all of the crimes that affect minorities disproportionately. The number of people who are arrested on uh, drug charges is is vastly higher among the black population than it is among the white population as uh, in, 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 in percentage terms, even and though drug, as use well. and drug, drug use is about the same. 
There, there's no reason for that other than uh, a uh, selective enforcement on the part of police departments. Yeah, I call them social engineering laws. There was a bunch of laws that politicians use to try to engineer society to look the way they want it to look. And these poor police officers are put in a position where they having to use a gun in a cage to force people to behave in a way they don't want to behave. It, it's fundamentally dehumanizing, not to, to both the police officer and the, and the, the citizens. Mm -hmm. Police officers now have to act around and act around as bullies. And, and out, over time, that's going to affect you mentally. It's going to affect your outlook on, on life and on the people you interact with. And citizens are now, as we saw during the lockdown, we're now just cattle to be pushed around. Mm -hmm. And, We've, we've got to find some different way to, to move forward. And if the unions don't act, you know, there are other things we can do. We can put investigations into the hands of, of civil rights organizations, ACLU or other organizations that can do these in, in, uh, investigations. We can put prosecutions into the hands of, of criminal defense attorney groups or some other kind of groups that want to take over that role. We don't have to continue the same path. I we know. Think, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of procedural solutions, but I think uh, it's also important to recognize the the basic pro uh, one of the other basic problems, which is that poverty and unemployment are much more widespread among uh, minority groups than they are among uh, uh, the population in, a, as a whole. Uh, due to the pandemic uh, mania or craze that's uh, taken place over the last several months, the uh, April unemployment numbers came out and. Uh, the unemployment rate, uh, and this is understated when you when you take a look at May, I'm sure. But as of April, the unemployment rate among Blacks was 17 percent, 19 percent among Hispanics, and uh, only 15 percent overall. Uh, there's a whole lot more uh, anger within the minority communities as a result of being unemployed, uh, and that's got to be something that, that creates the um, the uh, incentive for being on the street and being uh, uh, liable to be in a place where you shouldn't be when when the cops come looking. Mm. And yeah. then I think California's done done a horrible job as well. They've created an environment and unintended consequences that you used to be able to, uh, and I think uh, Richard, uh, you'll remember, in your youth, um, you could get I could get a blue collar job. I could get a job in a, in a local factory. I could get a job, I'm not talking about menial, menial labor, but labor where I could go in unskilled and there was a progression where I could, I could move up to form and I could learn a machine and become a skilled laborer and all the rest of that. But anything blue collar in the state of California is looked at with disdain. It's like you try to open a, a factory in the state of California where where people have a, a career path, it seems like the the only career path that that California politicians want people to have is get a college degree. And unfortunately, yeah, there aren't enough there aren't job enough jobs job. out there for those people with a basic college degree that doesn't have an S on the end of it to support them. Go ahead, Richard. I'm sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, no, I, I was interrupting you. That's okay. I, yeah. I do it all the time. No, no. I, yeah, we have an education system that, that supports white collar crimes and not blue collar, or, uh, I'm sorry, white collar jobs and not blue collar jobs. And we have a, uh, uh, a licensing scheme which protects uh, people who do have blue collar jobs to the expense of those who want to have blue collar jobs and everything from landscaping to uh, uh, cutting uh, hair, to, you name it. I mean, it's really, really difficult to get started in even the, the lowest skilled jobs because they're protected by uh, quasi-government, well, government uh, government licensing schemes. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of reasons that uh, we have a have a uh, economic problem uh, in the uh, in the in the in the state as well as across the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and in the it's things like AB five have made it even more difficult for people in the our low income communities to increase their income. We can no longer as easily go out and earn money as we did. I mean, during the pandemic, well, yeah, it's kind of been a little bit easier, but with 85, if you're a gig worker, if you're a musician or, or a stenographer, or the list is literally endless of how many jobs have been affected by AB5, it's not just people like me who go do driving for a living. It's literally everybody. There's musicians and artists and, and use community theaters. The list is so long. I literally, I try to run it by and it goes too fast in my head and I can't keep up, keep up. Then I get tongue tied, but it's, it's a yeah, disgrace. Yeah. And we're losing actually a fundamental, it does more than just jobs. It's 
tearing apart our communities, these community centers and these community theaters and these artists that go that bounce between all these various different ones, they can no longer do that. And it's ripping these hearts of our communities and the coronavirus on top of it. And it's all just, it's, it's been saddening to watch. I sit here in my, in my office and I watch on TV and people talk to me about what's going on in, in their lives and all these stories about how their lives have been all upended. And now they're having to go back and work a nine to five job that they hate instead of being an artist. And it's it's heartbreaking. It's just yeah, and the other thing. The, the other thing that's happening is this is not just Minneapolis. It's obviously uh, expanded to uh, Santa Monica, obviously Sacramento, and you know hundreds of other cities across the country. This is something that has kind of caught fire, sort of the way the civil rights uh, riots caught fire back in the uh, back in the '60s, and the Rodney King uh, riots took took part, you know took fire, got caught fire across the country back in the uh, back in the '90s. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, and we've got a president that stokes the fire by saying, you loot, we'll shoot, and basically tweets and then hides in his bunker. Uh, we, we have, you know, just totally irresponsible leadership. I'm concerned uh, with the larger picture. We have a uh, foreign policy situation now where China is seeing all of the mayhem and confusion and chaos going in the United States and saying, you know, I, I think it's, you know, a really good time for us to make our move into solidifying our control of Hong Kong and maybe even Taiwan. Uh, China, as we speak, is making noises about turning, uh, you know, including Hong Kong in the police state that is China and also making noises, uh, at least tentative noises, about making sure that uh, they bring Taiwan into its uh, firmer control than it already is. And those are the kinds of, uh, of uh, geopolitical uh, issues that could really fire up the neocon, neocon base in the United States and encourage Trump, who has been relatively good on not getting involved in foreign wars. I say relatively, that's a, you know, a loaded term, but he's better than some of, the other, some of his predecessors. Uh, but you could encourage him into getting involved in a war with China as a wag the dog war, something that would put him in the position of commander in chief who, who will vote against the commander in chief during wartime. It doesn't happen very often. If that happens, we could be on the verge of uh, a World War III that would not be, uh, that would not rule out the use of nuclear warfare. We've got, we've got a, a really, really volatile situation geopolitically as well as domestically. Well, I think, I, I think that, uh, I'll try to be quick so so that our yeah. political candidate can talk to this issue. I think the timing uh, is a little suspect of China doing this. If uh, you don't want to be under the microscope of the world asking questions about uh, are your numbers about this virus correct? Did it come out of a lab or a wet market? Uh, why didn't you report the numbers? Why didn't you let people in? All the rest of that. Uh, doing a, a quasi invasion of Hong Kong to, to wave another flag over here for people to look at so they're not paying attention to what you've done previously. It's a great, I mean, they're wonderful politicians. So the timing is a little interesting on this, to say the least. I'm, and James, sorry, I interrupted. Well, not to scare you guys and make things a little more unpredictable, but we also have to remember that there's been some kind of underground reports of unrest in China. And now underground reports out of China are always kind of skeptical. It's hard to know, but You've got you. China might be having their own kind of wag the dog moment, trying to whip up some nationalism to kind of get their own people to kind of forget about the whole coronavirus and, mm -hmm. and that mess. And so there's there's so many pieces moving in play in, in this one. It it really is. It's actually genuinely scary. Mm -hmm. And and so much of us we are we're focused on you know the riots in our neighborhoods or in our cities, and we're not paying attention to the wider world. You know, mm -hmm. sadly, Hong Kong was essentially gone the minute. UK sent them over. You know, it was it was a it was a done deal. It was only a matter of time before China got them fully under control. It's just it's kind of surprised people it happened this fast. Mm -hmm. But Taiwan is a real concern because Taiwan actually has at least some ability to defend themselves, and it's we have men stationed there, so it that is a real concern. And we do we don't have someone in office who is sophisticated enough to think on six or seven levels at the same time. And that's what we need right now. And that actually makes the world very, very scary. Mm -hmm. Well, and the other thing, Hong Kong, um, kind of, you know, Hong Kong is, is this, this glowing beacon of capitalism and success and a high standard of living and low crime and, and people 
really making their way. And, and it's kind of like uh, East Germans when East, when Germany was divided, they, they were in this dark place on one side of the wall and they could receive television radio broadcasts from, from literally feet away showing what would be possible if they weren't under this, this crushing uh, regime they were under. And China, um, you know, looks like a, a model of uh, uh, growth and all the rest of that. But uh, the, the common lot of people who are not, you know, the favored billionaires and the quote unquote entrepreneurs, the oligarchs there, um, you know, they they looked, I think, on Hong Kong as as kind of a goal. And, you know, if you if you crush that beacon, then maybe that internal dissent you're talking about goes away. Well, I mean, China. I, I've been to China, and I, I would I didn't take issue with the uh, economic, with the lack of economic progress. Uh, China, it's it's real. I mean, they have increased their standard of living hundreds of fold uh, since they uh, uh, turned away from Maoism and the Great Leap Forward and all that. Uh, and you know, they've they've done a really really good job economically. They've done it in a totalitarian way, but they've done it in a way that that welcomes capitalism, although certainly crony capitalism to a certain extent, but they are less crony capitalist in many respects than the United States is. Uh, they're more willing to uh, give free reign to uh, private companies as long as those private companies don't get involved in politics in any way whatsoever. Mm. Uh, that's what I mean by totalitarian control on political level, but economically they're pretty, they're pretty free market. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and Hong Kong is also a very free market, or what has been. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I think, you know, the, the long and the short of it is one way or another, China is going to take control of Hong Kong in 1940 or in 2047. It would happen anyway. Uh, they're, they're just trying to step up the calendar. Uh, I don't think it'll affect their economy in, in Hong Kong or in, in mainland China all that much. What it will do is stifle any political dissent in Hong Kong, as well as the stifled political dissent we are already seeing in mainland China. Uh, Taiwan is another another case entirely. They're, uh, for all intents and purposes, fully autonomous and do have the ability to to fight back. And whether or not the United States gets involved there is really, really a, a tough question. And I have no idea how that would play out. Well, they do have some water in between them and China, which helps. You know, it's uh, it's not, yeah, yeah, not it's not, not that, an not ocean, that, not but uh, you know, it's. Uh, um, Seaborne invasions or airborne invasions of places are, are pretty tough to do. You, it's way easier to destroy a country than to invade a country. And uh, I, I think uh, the world opinion might stop just short of sending troops to stop them, but it would get awfully close to that. So I, I'm not saying Taiwan doesn't have anything to, or Form, Formosa is what the Chinese call it, I believe. Um, but you know, you're right. We live in scary times. And, uh, and James, I, wrap up yeah. your, we just got a couple minutes left. Wrap up your, uh, your pitch to the voters of uh, Assembly District 7. Why should they vote for you instead of the... Uh, we have no time left, Richard. I'm the best guy to vote for. There you go. Oh, we knew that. Yeah. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, 